I now want to introduce you to a cool reaction called Sharpless Epoxidation. It's very useful. In fact, its inventor, Barry Sharpless, won the Nobel Prize for discovering it back in 2001. This reaction might look simple, and it sort of is, but that's part of what makes it so useful. It's simple, yet powerful. The overall reaction works as follows. Our starting material has to be an allyl alcohol, like this one. Remember, an allyl alcohol is an alcohol in which the OH is one carbon away from a carbon-carbon double bond. You'll remember our song. Allyl, 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 one away from his pals. Ooh! If we react our allyl alcohol with tert-butyl hydroperoxide and minus DET, we can faithfully, reproducibly, and predictably get a single enantiomer of this epoxide. DET, by the way, stands for diethyl tartrate, which is a diethylated derivative of tartaric acid, a widely available compound found in grapes and bananas. This reaction has its complementary counterpart, for if I treat the same allyl alcohol with tert-butyl hydroperoxide and plus DET, I can get the opposite enantiomer with high fidelity. This reaction, believe it or not, is extremely useful, which brings us back to a principle I introduced to you in Chapter 5. You can't get chirality in a product unless you already have chirality in your starting material or in one of your reagents. I found a recently published synthesis that used Sharpless epoxidation as a key step. In this paper, the Yadov group from the Indian Institute of Chemical Technology synthesized molecule 1 over a number of steps. I hope you can all see that compound 1 is an allyl alcohol. This compound, which contains no stereocenters, was treated with Sharpless epoxidation conditions to furnish molecule 2 in 77% yield with 94% enantiomeric excess. Now we've talked about enantiomeric excess, or EE, before. To explain, a 94% EE means that 97% of the product mixture formed from this reaction was the enantiomer 2 shown here, and that 3% of the product mixture was the opposite enantiomer. Is this a pretty cool reaction? You bet because it enabled these scientists to take molecule 1, which is completely achiral, and convert it with near complete exclusivity into molecule 2, which is chiral. Compound 2, incidentally, was then transformed over various steps into this molecule, amphidinylid T1, an anti-cancer compound isolated from a murine protist. And as I already mentioned, the Sharpless epoxidation is a very useful reaction. In fact, to date, this is one of the few reactions that can be reproducibly done on an industrial scale to introduce chirality into a molecule. Much to your crapulent surprise, I'm sure, we still have a few more oxidation reactions to cover. We now arrive at this one, dihydroxylation of alkenes using osmium tetroxide. See, if you have an alkene like this, and you treat it with osmium tetroxide followed by a peroxide quench, you get this type of diol. This diol is called a 1,2 diol, or a vicinal diol. It's important to note that the, al or the diol product that you get always ends up having the two oxygens being added syn or cis to each other. Thus, if I begin with this starting alkene, cyclohexene, and treat it with osmium tetroxide followed by peroxide quench, I get this cis 1,2-cyclohexane diol. So you should remember, once again, that this reaction always gives you the cis 1,2-diol. The mechanism shown here partially is interesting, but I do not require you to know it. Incidentally, I, I saw a recent episode of J.J. Abrams' sci-fi TV show Fringe that featured an osmium-containing compound that gave certain individuals the ability to fly. Chemically, this is total crap, but entertainmently, it's pure gold. If you take a 1,2-diol, that's what these kinds of compounds are called, and react it with periodic acid, HiO4, which I like to call HiO4, it actually cuts the bond between these two carbons just like a saw. It then takes the two carbon halves 
and installs double bonds between each of these two carbons and the oxygen to which they're attached, giving you these products. If you want to know the mechanism, this is sort of how it works partially. But once again, I don't require you to know it. And here's a sweet example. In this example, you can once again see that we have a 1,2 diol in my starting material. I react it with hi 4 The carbon-carbon bond is severed, and each of these carbons becomes doubly bonded to its adjoining oxygen, giving you this product right here. We can get a similar outcome by using this reaction called ozonolysis. But there's one major difference you should pay attention to here. In an ozonolysis reaction, our starting material is not a 1,2 diol. It's an alkene. Like our hi 4 reaction, however, when we treat this starting material, this alkene, with ozone, O3, followed by a selected workup, the ozone saws this carbon-carbon double bond in half and then installs oxygen on the end of each of these carbons. So once again, we just saw this just like a saw and plop an oxygen doubly bonded each of these carbon halves, giving these products here. As it turns out, your ozonolysis product can vary depending on which workup condition you choose. If we work up our reaction using zinc and water, or this compound, which is called dimethyl sulfide, then we'll cleave our carbon-carbon double bond and plop, of course, our double bonded oxygens here onto each of the carbon-carbon halves, no sweat, just as I showed you in the previous line. As I mentioned, you can also quench this reaction with DMS, dimethyl sulfide, and get the same results. The problem is that quenching it with dimethyl sulfide isn't ideal because DMS smells like a monkey's anus. Now in contrast, if I quench our reaction with peroxide, H2O2, something slightly different happens. You see, during a peroxide quench, if these two carbon atoms have hydrogens on them, and notice I've circled the first one, it does have a hydrogen atom on it, then that hydrogen atom gets converted into an OH in the product. So once again, I saw right between the, this carbon-carbon double bond, plop an oxygen onto the end, giving me a carbon-oxygen double bond in the product, but one of the H's, or the H here, is converted into an OH. You'll notice that the second carbon has two hydrogens on it. So under these conditions, quenching with H2O2, the product that I get, only one of those two hydrogens gets replaced with an OH. Now I hasten to mention that I don't require you to know the mechanism for this reaction, but if you want to learn it, and it really is cool, I think, then please consult section 20.9 in your book.